Welcome back into the GSMC Sports Podcast. We just finished up doing some power rankings on the the remaining college basketball teams in the NCAA tournament. Now we are going to be switching into some coaching carousel of the of the um, moves that have recently taken place. We have a handful of new hirings, but before we get into those, we're going to briefly talk here about John Calipari returning to Kentucky. We talked about this at length earlier this week, so we won't spend all too much time on it, but Calipari did recently meet with Kentucky's athletic director, Mitch Barnhart, and it was determined that he will be returning for the 2024-2025 season. This does not come as a massive surprise to me. Kentucky did suffer one of, if not the biggest loss in tournament history during the Calipari era, which had a lot of people calling for his job. It's been a tough stretch here for the Wildcats where since they made the Elite Eight in 2019, they have only won one tournament game and that was to a double digit seeded providence a couple years ago they have lost to a 15 seeded st peters and a 14 seeded oakland during that stretch as well so some bad losses to the resume it would have cost kentucky 33 million dollars though to move off of him this off season instead they decide to stick it out with him I feel like one thing that does sort of get overlooked in this conversation, and I'm not saying definitively that it should outweigh the other aspects. Of course, the number one job for a coach is to win games. We all know that. But of course, with this developing college sports atmosphere where there is so much emphasis on Recruiting, there always has been recruiting, but then it's also with the NIL deals and making sure that you can retain these players once you recruit them as well. It is a lot that you have to balance here. And not that, again, this should be the number one priority. It always comes down to winning first, but something that Cal Perry has been amazing at during his tenure here at Kentucky has been recruiting and that isn't going anywhere. They've had so much success. Of course, Kentucky is a big-time program, but I do think that Calipari helps sort of sell the idea of Kentucky. Come here, we can set you up nicely for the NBA and advance your career professionally. As it currently stands, now, of course, we are still sitting here in March, so there's plenty of time here to see how it all unfolds, but according to 247 Sports, they currently have Kentucky as the number two recruiting class for the 2024-25 season. Now, as we saw this past season, they had a phenomenal recruiting class They had all of these different freshmen that were supposed to be impact guys for them, along with a couple players in Antonio Reeves and Trey Mitchell that were seniors for the program, and they still were falling short. Again, I've covered this before. The defensive strategy and the execution for Kentucky all season was a big-time red flag for Calipari and how the program is operating but at the same time they're getting these guys to come in and contribute some we'll see if he can help take that to the next level he's definitely on thin ice at the school and another disappointing season could be the end of him in lexington but we will see i'm not sure how long term it was 33 million dollars to buy him out this season I'm not sure what the long-term outlook is just yet in terms of when they would potentially have an out. It was reported that his deal after 2019 was a lifetime contract. Cal Perry is now 65, I believe. So he's getting up there in age, but it's not like he is 
you know, on the brink of retirement just yet. So we'll have to see how the upcoming recruiting class plays out, what goes on with their freshmen from this past season, because Rob Dillingham and Reed Shepard are going to be clear lottery picks. They will be leaving the school. You have Antonio Reeves and Trey Mitchell that should be graduating. I believe that Reeves is out of eligibility. I'm not sure what the exact situation is with Trey Mitchell, but they were both seniors this past year, and that is probably it for them. Um... But they also have all these other freshmen in DJ Wagner, Justin Edwards, Aaron Bradshaw, and Big Z Avisic, who are all interesting pieces to see how they play out. Maybe some of them could end up being late draft picks. Not totally sure about that. I've been higher on DJ Wagner, I think, than a lot of mock drafts have been. Justin Edwards is someone who's also had his name thrown out there as well, but a lot of these guys were five stars coming into Kentucky last season, and this season hasn't totally worked out for them. Will they stick another year in college? Most of them probably should. Will it be with Kentucky is another question as well. So we'll have to see how all of this plays out. But getting into some hirings that have taken place and some new faces in new pla old faces new places is the uh, term but we have dusty may going to michigan michigan had fired the former wolverine Jawan howard after just an abysmal season this past year where they were 8 and 24 3 and 17 in conference play and they were last in the big 10 absolutely not the level of performance that you expect from this Michigan program. Um, so they bring in Dusty May, who has led Florida Atlantic University to back-to-back -to -back NCAA tournament appearances, including last season's Final Four runs. FAU was a little bit disappointing this past year. They won a handful of games, ended up being an eight seed, but suffered some really bad losses along the way. Again, sort of you determine how you want to weigh that but they ended up being an eight seed a lot of people said they were overseeded but again another tournament appearance for this program in FAU that was really struggling in the years leading up to May taking over so he was a hot commodity in this coaching carousel he was associated with Louisville at one point Vanderbilt was trying to make a push for him, but he ends up at Michigan, gets the upgrade to a power conference, and we'll see how it plays out for them because Michigan is a brand that when they are good, it is usually better for the, the, the NCAA and college basketball as a whole. We'll see how long it takes him to sort of turn things around there. But like I mentioned, Vanderbilt was making a push for Dusty May. He ends up choosing Michigan. So they get a consolation prize of Mark Byington, for, who was previously at James Madison. Um, he led JMU to a 32-4 and record this past season, their first NCAA tournament win since 2013 when they had a first four win there this was their first round of 32 appearance since 1983 Vanderbilt was really bad this year they have been really sputtering for the past handful of seasons they were just 9 and 23 this past year only one overall game better than the miserable Missouri program that went winless in conference play. So Vanderbilt, they've really been trying to build up the program for a handful of years. It has not been tremendous, but Byington was successful with JMU. So we will see whether or not that ends up working out for them. A big name here. Maybe not the most well-known from a national perspective, but a massive story if you were keeping up with college basketball this season was Danny Sprinkle, who was with Utah State in his first season. 
he is now leaving already and going to the Washington Huskies. Sprinkle has seen his coaching trajectory really skyrocket after putting together some impressive seasons at Montana State, where he led them to a couple big-time seasons there. Then it catapulted him to Utah State in the Mountain West, where this past season they went 28-7, and won the Mountain West regular season title. I know that they just got embarrassed against Purdue over the weekend, but don't let that take away from the fact that this has been a great job by Sprinkle, who has had to deal with a lot of roster turnover in from the past couple seasons with this program, from their players themselves to the coaching staff, where I believe this is their fourth head coaching hire in the next in the past five years, something along those lines. And Sprinkle did a really good job to put this thing together and develop some of their players. We saw the season that Osibor had Greg, Greg, I forget, I'm blanking on his first name actually, but Osibor and the way that he performed this past season. Again, 28 and 7, a very solid year for Utah State. There was a clear buy in from the locker room there, and ultimately he's going to be moving on to Washington, makes another step to a power conference. Washington is actually headed to the Big Ten, so he will be along with Dusty May in the Big Ten in their new jobs. Final one here is Kyle Smith, who was hired by Stanford. This is a little bit of an interesting move here, where Kyle Smith, I did think, did a very solid job at Washington State this past year. I thought that they were a little bit underrated. The fact that they were a seven seed and were underdogs against Drake. He and they end up winning that game. He won 20 plus games in all of his years with San Francisco before. And now he puts together this solid season with Washington state. Um, what the Washington state is in a very weird scenario as they currently stay in the PAC 12 as it is the conference as a whole is really falling apart here. And now we see their head coach leaving to go with Stanford. That has at times been a good program, but have not reached the NCAA tournament since 2014. Um, we also important to note here that this will be Stanford's upcoming first season in the ACC. So a little bit of a change there as well. I forgot there was actually one last um, coaching change as well. And that is Darian DeVries getting the head coaching job at West Virginia. We just talked about Washington State actually playing Drake. And that was a matchup of Kyle Smith and of DeVries here. So for this, this job, I mean, Drake has been a prominent mid-major school to be continuing to make the conference uh three ncaa tournaments under tucker devries they even notably a couple years ago were in at large bid they didn't win their conference but they were still put into the dance and drake has won 20 games in 20 games or more in each season that devries has been with the team so they end up taking he ends up taking over for west virginia You'll remember West Virginia was a pretty prominent program just a couple years ago when Bob Huggins was there, but he got into some issues that forced West Virginia to fire him, and now they re-up here in for West Virginia. I believe that his son, Tucker DeVries, who was one of the leading scorers in NCAA this season, has another year of eligibility. If that is the case, then he will probably be joining his father at West Virginia, and we could possibly see a resurgence from the program there. But that is all the news that we have for now. We're going to be taking our second break, and when we come back, we will be getting into some 
basketball here, some NBA and the gambling scandals that are surrounding Jonte Porter. So stick with us and we will be right back. 